Well, hi, everybody, and welcome. Really appreciate you joining us today to talk about the choice facing Ontario voters as they head to the polls in just a couple of days' time. However you vote, you, everyone knows will be shaping the future of the province. So that's why the Gen Squeeze team over here has been working hard to bring you the unvarnished truth about how the party promises stack up on key issues in this election. So as I mentioned, my name is Andrea Long. As it says on the screen, I'm the Director of uh, Research and Knowledge Mobilization at Generation Squeeze. And I'm joined by Paul Kershaw, who's a policy professor and the Gen Squeeze founder. And we're both speaking to you today, in fact, not in what I understand is very warm Ontario, um, but from BC's Fraser Valley on the unceded traditional territory of the Katsi people. And as we talk about the platforms that your political leaders have put forward on behalf of many Ontarians who also live on unceded land, just want to say that it's important to think deeply about our shared responsibility to reconciliation. So for any Gen Squeeze newbies who might be listening in either live or to a recorded version of this podcast, um, Gen Squeeze is Canada's leading organization fighting for generational fairness. And achieving, gener achieving generational fairness to us means asking all Canadians to do three things. One, to be good stewards by preserving what's sacred today for younger and future generations, like a stable climate or a healthy childhood and a good home. It means asking all Canadians to foster generational reciprocity by upholding what we call the intergenerational golden rule to do unto other generations as you would have them do unto you. And finally, it means asking Canadians to plan for all ages by asking our governments to invest in well being from the early years onwards. So elections are, of course, key moments to talk about generational fairness, because that's when our political parties are especially attentive to what matters to all those folks in Ontario. Uh, in recent weeks, we've been hearing from the parties quite a lot about what they think they're doing to promote well-being for all generations. And in our mind, that just shows the power of our voters guide, which is what we're going to talk about today, and that assesses how close each party comes to meeting goals on making housing and family life more affordable, fighting climate change, and budgeting fairly for all age groups. So our plan for today is pretty informal. We want to have a conversation about the voter's guide and the punchlines for the four issues that we examine in it. We do invite you to ask questions throughout the event. Chime in anytime you hear something which you're interested in exploring further or something you maybe don't agree with. We'll work to answer as many of your questions as we can. Um, because the event today is being recorded live, participant lines are going to remain muted throughout. Um, so if you want to ask a question, please use the chat function or the Q&A function to share it with us. And of course, if we do happen to run out of time before we get to answer everybody's questions, um, you can find the whole voter's guide and the pages and pages of analysis that support it uh, at gensqueeze.ca. So but just before we jump in, I did just want to flag to folks and emphasize that Gen Squeeze is strongly committed to nonpartisanship in all of our work. We certainly do not tell you who to vote for, and we don't intend for any of our work to point to any party in a favorable or unfavorable light. Success for us is that all parties have equally strong platforms to promote generational fairness, and our aim is to help equip Ontario voters to go into the ballot box as informed as possible on generational fairness issues. So with all that being said, why don't we start off, Paul, by chatting a bit more about the Voters Guide itself. So many people probably are already following all the election media, the announcements from parties, maybe they watched the debate among the leaders. So what does the Gen Squeeze Voters Guide actually add to this mass of election information? What's, what's our value add with this product? Hi, this is a great question, Andrea. Thanks so much, and thanks for the great intro. I think that our voter's guide is intended to add several things. On the one hand, given that we know that politics responds to those who organize and show up, we know that showing up at voting day into the ballot box is a really important way for a younger demographic to flex its democratic muscles. And sometimes um, we've heard over the years that, that people are like, well, I don't know who to cast a ballot for. I'm not sure if the party platforms are all that different. Where do I get good information about what's meaningful and what's not and the promises they're making? Will, will any of it make a difference? And so we hope that the first thing that the Voter's Guide does is make people feel more confident that they can go to one place at gensqueeze.ca and find a range of information about housing and family policy and climate change and budgeting fairly for all generations that 
comes uh, from the academy is intended to be evidence-based. We showcase also the values that are driving our analyses. And then you can do with that as you will and potentially count that as one factor that may shape how you mark your ballot on voting day. And so hopefully we have more people going out and casting a ballot. I think the second key thing that it does is because politics responds to those who organize and show up, we want to demonstrate as an organization that we're able to show up in a meaningful way during elections to help voters make meaning of what the party pro parties are promising. And the more that we're able to demonstrate that we're good meaning makers and that we can attract media to help share our message about the, the, the value of the promises that parties are putting out there, then the more that we have parties saying, ah, oh, maybe we ought to be trying to score better on the gen squeeze evaluations in their voters guide. And indeed, when we do our analyses, not only do we share them with our constituency and with the media, but we then share them with the parties. And that creates an opportunity for the people in the parties designing those platforms to dialogue with us about what do we want to see? How might they get a better score? Were we fair in giving them the score that we did? Maybe we missed something. And so it creates an opportunity for us to dialogue more with the parties. And that then builds relationships in the world of politics. And ultimately, one of these parties is going to go on to have the, the most influence in the next legislature. And then we've already set up a range of conversations to hopefully try and shape the next budget so that it invests well for young and old alike. Yeah, those are certainly really important, I think, contributions and aspirations that the organization have. And I think it's especially important to observe that elections are critical in and of themselves, um, and obviously will shape uh, the next four years, we assume, of Ontario politics. But they're also important because they are the sort of the starting point to a cycle where we then move into budgets. And those are important in terms of setting the policy priorities and spending priorities of, of government. So thanks, thanks for talking a little bit more about that, Paul. Um, so you touched on in that description, you mentioned um, uh, one of the key issues that we've all heard about uh, in this election, which is housing. Uh, and some commentators have even called this the housing election for Ontario. Uh, and it's pretty clear why, if you've been following the news or even Jen Squeeze's research on this matter, because housing unaffordability in Ontario has reached epic proportions. So what if you can tell us, and thanks, I see you've put up our, our party scorecard here. Tell us a bit about why Jen Squeeze, what Jen Squeeze is saying about how the parties are doing on their housing plans and whether anyone is doing enough. Great. Well, one of the things that I think is really important to point out is that in Ontario, the housing, the housing dysfunction has really reached epic proportions. And so we did at the beginning of the, of the election this year, release a new study showcasing that Ontario over the first two years of the pandemic lost control over home prices more rapidly than did any other province at the time, and more rapidly than any other province at the last, uh, any other province in the last half century. And so that is a terrible record to have if our goal is producing more affordability. Although we did point out that it was at the same time, a great moment for homeowners in terms of printing wealth windfalls for those who were already homers and full disclosure, I am out West. And so that was the starting point for our housing analysis. And, I'm so pleased that housing has been such a strong focus for the campaign, but I'm a little bit nervous that despite this central focus of housing affordability, I haven't yet heard any single party leader say, going forward, over the next mandate, they don't want home prices to rise, that they want to restore affordability for all by having home prices stall so that earnings can catch up. I was really looking for that as like a top line uh, signal about the degree to which a party or a bunch of parties were going to start taking housing affordability really seriously. And I'm disappointed that none of the parties are doing that yet. And so in this scorecard that's on the screen right now, you'll see that we position the four parties, you know, in a bit of a race towards our goal that everyone in Ontario can be to afford a good home uh, by 2030. And we came up with that calculation based on looking at 15 different criteria. And those criteria fell into three broad categories. And I just lost everyone because they're all bored with all those numbers. But effectively, we were looking at our parties promising to scale up housing that's provided by the nonprofit sector, because we know more and more that the market's just not creating rental or homeownership or even co-op opportunities that are in reach for what people earn. Then 
a second cluster of activities. Are we actually fixing the regular market? Because even if we scale up not-for-profit housing, most people will still rely on the regular market to make a home. And then lastly, a primary concern for Gen Squeeze was any party willing to say that, you know what, there's an addiction in Ontario and across this country to high and rising home prices. How are we gonna change policies to disrupt that addiction? So that's what we were looking at. And you can see that the, the NDP, the Greens and the Liberals, they're, they're kind of clustered together. The NDP are in the front, they scored the highest, followed closely by the Greens and then the Liberals. And those three have a gap between them with the Conservatives. And I think that reflects two key things about the Conservatives. One, the Conservatives actually had much less emphasis on using the, non the nonprofit sector to try and address some of the housing affordability crisis. The, the, the Conservatives got out ahead of everyone and saying, hey, we want one and a half million homes built over the next decade in Ontario. Uh, that was put out by their Affordable Housing Task Force. Then all of the other parties adopted that. So there's no disagreement about the parties with the need to build more supply. But the Conservatives are less clear about the degree to which they want to build some of that supply in the nonprofit sector. The other parties are better. Interestingly, when you then focus on fixing the regular market, you might have thought this would be a place where the Conservatives would be especially strong. I expected uh, candidate Ford to be especially strong on this issue. <clears throat> in terms of building new supply, though, not only do the Conservatives say, hey, we're, we're, we're going to put some of that energy into the nonprofit sector. They don't say that. But they're not even clear, like, are you going to build rentals? Like, is that going to be a priority? Are you going to build housing that actually is simultaneously going to be low, like, energy efficient so it contributes to our housing goal, our climate change goals? Um, and so they're, they're less, is it going to have enough bedrooms for families with kids? They're just more like, we're going to let the market deliver a bunch of housing. But we know that unless we are trying to be a little more specific, that it's rental housing, because we need more of that, and it's going to be with enough bedrooms and it's energy efficient, we don't have enough of that signal from the, the Conservatives, as I was expecting. You see more of that in the other three parties. And lastly, we do know that we need par uh, our parties to want to dial down some examples of harmful demand. So whether that's going to be money laundering or speculation or foreign buyers or um, the way in which there might be some blind bidding, this is getting a bit wonky in terms of how, you know, some shady real estate practices. Interestingly, you know, all parties are starting to focus on that more. The Conservatives tackle about half of those shady, problematic examples of un unhelpful, harmful demand, whereas the other three parties are much more focused on trying to tick off addressing all of them, especially the Greens. They ticked off all that were in our list, uh, and the Liberals and the NDP got all but one. So I'll pause there for a sec. Thanks. Yeah, lots, certainly lots to digest there. Uh, I just wanted to pivot for a moment to a question that uh, we received from someone participating today. Uh, and that person's actually a, a Gen Squeeze Keener, yay, uh, yay person. Thank you so much. Because um, they're asking about the uh, Ontario Housing Affordability Report that we actually released um, just prior to our work on the Voter's Guide, uh, and particularly some of the numbers in there around how things have shifted in terms of down payments uh, for younger folks um, and, and um, the obstacles that presents for people trying to get into the market. So I wonder if you could just expand maybe a little bit on on that piece. Yeah, what a great question. So I always like to compare housing today to when my mom started out in the housing market as a young woman. So that takes us back to the mid-1970s. And back then in Ontario, it would have taken the typical young adult, say 25 to 34, five years of full-time work to save a 20% down payment on an average price home. Now, if you brought us to the last election time, Ontario would have lost control over home prices to the degree that it now had taken 16 years of full-time work. So that's like losing more than a decade of time trying to save for a down payment. But what I find so shocking is that since the last election, the typical young person in Ontario has lost yet another six years of work that they have to put in to save that 20% down payment because home prices have been relentlessly skyrocketing upwards as earnings have actually been stagnant or falling after inflation. And so this is a cru soul crushing experience. And especially over the pandemic, most of that harm happened in Ontario in the last couple of years. And yes, there are some pandemic related factors that contributed to it. And you can see that playing out in other provinces across the country. But what's so noticeable, and I, I said this earlier in the pod already, it was in Ontario where over the last couple of years that, that the province lost most ground more than anywhere else in the country 
over the pandemic and over any other time in the last half century. And I think that is a record that we just can't see moving forward uh, once the June 2nd election happens. We need whatever party gets in there to double down and say, we need home prices to stall. So hopefully that I made sense of the, the some, of, some of the age comparisons there and the amount of work required uh, to save that down payment because that's one of our main metrics at Chain Squeeze. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that. Um, just one more question that's uh, come in from folks in the audience today, um, and that's particularly around one piece of the pillar you mentioned that uh, we call breaking the addiction to high and rising home values. So, of course, there's lots of attention these days in Ontario and across the country about inflation and the rising prices on all sorts of goods and services, um, and housing has been an interesting part of that discussion in that housing prices have been inflating for years, um, but suddenly now that other things are, uh, we're seeing inflation and other things, it's becoming more of a prevalent issue. Um, but just hoping you could speak in response to this question about um, what you see the parties don't say, aren't saying anything about um, how we can address the lack of attention to housing price inflation. So if we could say a little bit more about what our options are for the province to address that. All right, this is an audience member getting into the weeds a little bit. I'm so excited about this particular weed because it's important. And it's annoying that actually none of the parties have picked this theme up during the campaign or in their platforms in advance because it doesn't cost them anything. What we know is that um, right now we're talking a lot about inflation in Canada because gas prices are up and food prices are up and a range of other things are up. And that's partly a reflection of the war in Ukraine, supply chain issues during the pandemic and so on. But we also know that housing prices have been going up for literally decades. So why didn't we sound the inflation alarm many, many years ago? The answer to that question is because Statistics Canada doesn't measure actual housing prices when they calculate inflation in this country. And I don't want to get too much in the weeds in this, but the, real, the, real, the result is that when calculating the degree to which there is little or a lot of inflation in Canada, the Statistics Canada agency is not calculating what's happening with housing prices very well. And as a result, they have tended to underreport the degree to which we have housing inflation in the country. That's been a problem because it's then signaled to the Bank of Canada, we don't have really a big inflation problem over the last couple of decades. So the, the Bank of Canada has been able to keep our interest rates low. And when we have lower interest rates, what's been happening? Canadians borrow more. And when we borrow more, we tend to invest in real estate and bid up the price of housing. Unfortunately, then StatsCan didn't pick that up and report, hey, inflation problem. And so the interest rates were kept low by the Bank of Canada, which is why actually there's a little bit of a silver lining to the discussion that we're now having about inflation driven by gas prices and driven by food increases, et cetera, because that has pushed our inflation measure above the 2% threshold that attracts attention from the Bank of Canada. And what have they done? They've started raising interest rates. And what has happened? that has started to put a downward pressure on home prices. So if only the, the parties running for office in Ontario would join forces and, and say, hey, Statistics Canada, you need to do a better job of measuring housing inflation in the future so that our province never again has to deal with, um, to some degree, the monetary policy from the Bank of Canada that is uh, inflicting some collateral damage onto our housing affordability. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, I think it's interesting that uh, now the parties have grabbed hold of that, as you said, relatively low cost uh, uh, opportunity to um, act on some of the housing pressures. Let's hope maybe they'll pivot to that in the future. Um, so just conscious of time and thinking, let's maybe move on to uh, the next portion of the voter's guide, because housing, of course, isn't the only place where affordability is an issue for many families in Ontario. So another piece is being able to afford to start a family if you so choose. Um, and that's an issue we've heard far less about uh, through this election. So hoping you can tell us a little bit about what the voter's guide analysis tells us about how the parties stack up on family affordability. Yeah, well, I think we've heard a little bit less about family affordability because at the federal level, and if any of our Gen Squeeze regular listeners to Hard Truths have been paying attention, they'll know that we got excited about the most recent federal budget in particular because we have made 
Uh, we have seen our, our federal government make an historic investment into childcare. Under the banner of $10 a day childcare, which was a, a branding for a national childcare recommendation that we take a lot of pride in here at Gen Squeeze. We started that in our lab over a decade ago. And it's great to see the federal government pick up that moniker, say we don't want childcare ever again to be another rent or mortgage sized payment and that we can't have childcare in the future continuing to be twice as much, cost twice as much as say university tuition. So because that federal investment was made, you can see that all of the provincial parties are now embracing $10 a day childcare. And so there's not nearly as much competition on that front. Um, and so if, if you're looking for like, does any party say something a little more significant around childcare specifically, I think I'd have to give the nod towards the NDP because not only are they committed to the dollars that are required to keep uh, fees lower for parents going forward and they're gonna escalate that as will the other parties, but the NDP are also committed in a more concrete way to making sure that the childcare workers are gonna get pay equity level wages. Uh, a lot of the time in Canada's childcare system, we will actually pay the hardworking, talented childcare workers, disproportionately women, often women of color, less money than we'll pay parking lot attendants, or less money than we pay people to clean the cages at zoos. And so we, we really need to have gender equality in childcare as we're starting to scale up our $10 a day system. And uh, in this case, I'd say that NDP has a little bit more on that front, but all parties, because of what's happening at the federal level, embracing 10 a day. Woohoo! Yes, woohoo indeed. And um, some folks uh, participating today may know that actually the $10 a day childcare branding actually originated in the Gen Squeeze Knowledge Mobilization Lab at the University of British Columbia. So we have a long history in advocating and pushing for this issue, of course, alongside the many other voices who have become key to turning this promise into a reality, which is really exciting for Canada. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Paul. I didn't tell you a key thing that actually differentiates the parties. And as anyone's looking in our live podcast right now, the scorecard I have up on the screen, it wasn't actually the NDP that led on this issue. Uh, ultimately, I was just going to tell you that you hadn't mentioned, but the Liberals are ahead, not an NDP. Yeah, exactly. And so <laughs> the Liberals really jump out front in terms of the overall family policy uh, scoring in our analysis, because the Liberals not only speak well about investing in childcare, which supports parents, moms and dads alike to have enough time in the labor market to earn enough to you know, to be able to meet the, the costs of raising a family. But they also talk about the importance of having parental time at home. Um, and, they, and the Liberals emphasize this theme more than the other parties do. And in fact, I really wanna give a shout out to the Liberals on this theme because they're the first provincial party outside of Quebec that I've actually seen make parental leave a priority for their own provincial policy because a lot of parental leave policy actually takes place at the federal level. And so here you actually have the liberals saying, we know that there are weaknesses in the federal policy and we can help fix them here in our province just as Quebec has set out to fix them some years ago. And so because the liberals are talking about wanting to make parental leave more affordable across the current 18 months that are available for leave and thinking about how to raise the benefit level so that families can take advantage of it, including dads to try and get dads sharing more time at home with their kids, which we know is good for gender equality, we know is good for child development, and we know is good for marital relationships. Um, I th we, we ultimately gave the nod to the, lib uh, the liberal party in terms of promoting family affordability from the perspective of people having enough, the choices to have enough time in the labor market and time at home. Yeah, thanks for thanks for explaining the the difference there between the liberal platform and the others. I think that's really important. Um, as you said, is notable, not only that they're talking about parental leave, but actually the inclusion of talking about encouraging fathers to take advantage of more leave is also, I think, worthy of praise on the liberal side as well. Um, someone's taking us up on our offer here to put out questions when they don't agree with us. So here's a awesome. question for you, Paul, on this platform. It's uh, sorry, on this uh, issue. Um, it's not a piece of the analysis that you've spoken about. It's part of um, the set of criteria that relate to work, work family, uh, work life balance. Um, and for anyone who's looked at our voters guide, there's a piece of that analysis that talks about how maybe uh, we mm -hmm. need to think about age of retirement and how long people's working lives are going to last, uh, given that people are living for longer and longer. And does that mean that we need to ask younger people to consider working for more years, but in exchange, have more work-life balance in each one of those years? So the question here is, 
you know, as families are facing affordability crunches with housing, with, with childcare, at least until we see 10 a day come in, um, and other rising prices for food and, and other goods, can we really, is it really fair to ask people to now turn around and say, hey, you also have to work longer? Yeah, I can understand why this is not the easiest sales pitch with a younger demographic right now, We're effectively saying, you know, we might have to push back the age of retirement, uh, given that um, we are living longer than people did in the past, just from the standpoint of our own personal finances and for, you know, government's public finances. But here's the, the thinking that really drives what we're saying and, and why I hope that this, this live podcast listener might lean in and, and think that it's not such a crazy idea. So you heard me say just a few moments ago that we know childcare is critical, and we know that time at home uh, with our kids is critical. And so the question is, how can we get the right balance of you know, work-life balance each year? So could that, mean, could that mean that we shift culturally instead of thinking that sort of 40 hours a week is the full-time work? What if we shifted down to 35 hours a week? Now, it doesn't sound like that big a deal, but we had the 40-week norm established back in the day when we often talked about one earner couples. One person worked 40 hours a week, often men, and then one person specialized caregiving at home. But because of a range of issues, both gender equality, but also affordability issues, you, you, we have more dual earner households. But do we need everybody working like 40 plus hours a week? Couldn't we scale down our full understanding of full-time norms? And that would give people a little more time each year, better balance. But if we were to do that each year, having better balance, can we potentially pay for that over our lives by recognizing that if we're living seven, 10 years longer than people did in the past, maybe we need to nudge up the total number of years that we work or nudge up the age of retirement. And I think that that's one of those prudent, hard truths that we likely need to think about. Many other countries have already been shifting their age of retirement. Canada has been slow to do that. Previous government proposed it and then got reversed. And I think it's one of those hard issues that a younger demographic lightly needs to think more about, but it ultimately gets us better balanced throughout our lives rather than lots and lots of stress pre-retirement. And then, oh, we get to retire and, and you know, sort of vacate entirely from the labor market then. Some people will say, hey, that's easy for a, you know, a white boy who works as a professor uh, who sits at a desk and you know, maybe he can imagine working past age 65 and someone who's like working out in construction or a range of other way more physical activities, think about nursing and whatnot, working in a care facility that they don't want to. And so I think we have to think those issues through, but this is one of the kind of culture change pieces that Gen Squeeze is putting out there for Canadians to think about as we try and get the right balance of our time in the early years when we're raising young kids and throughout our working lives into retirement. Yeah, it's interesting to see on that note that a couple of the parties, the Liberals and the NDP, have actually proposed at least some early experimentation or, or study of the idea of four-day work weeks uh, in their platform. So those are pretty preliminary commitments at this point, but I think it's notable to say that, notable to observe that it's written in their, in their platform as something that they're committed to taking a look at explicitly in the wake of pandemic-related pressures and the recognition that balancing work and family commitments is, is increasingly difficult. I think it's really critical. I think that this, this change towards having the, co the conversation about what is full-time work, how to get the most productivity out of people, how to find the right balance, what makes us happy. Uh, I think this is a conversation that's really ripe to have now coming out of the pandemic. And I'm happy that Jen Squeeze has sort of been ahead of the curve on this issue for a while. And I'm hoping that now that we're making some headway on $10 a day and you've got parties like the Liberals talking about improving parental leave policy, even at the provincial level, that this broader work-life balance issue can be a new place for us to start really maturing the policy conversation in Canada. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. Absolutely. Oh, but I didn't say one really important thing. Okay, go on for the it. Family policy piece. We, you know, I got so excited that, oh, at the federal level, they're investing in $10 a day. And so, you know, most parties are kind of like, yeah, tick that box. But I forgot to say the key thing for Gen Squeeze on, on childcare is that we think $10 a day should, $10 a day should be the maximum fee, not just the average fee. And this really matters to me. Like when people go to the doctor, we all pay the same fee. Fee. We pay no fee at the, at, at the door of the doctor. Same when we go to grade school, we don't pay any fee at the door, but then we expect higher earners or people with more wealth to contribute more through their taxation. I do not understand why we're treating childcare differently. Why are we thinking that we're just going to have this broader floating scale? Yes, we should have no fee for low-income households, but if we're going to have to have a fee at all, let's make sure the fee doesn't crap 
um, creep too high uh, for anyone such that they might encourage them to think, oh, I don't want to get into this $10 day child care system. I'll go look elsewhere, which then erodes the kind of broader political support for the new policy and ultimately doesn't recognize that when people earn more, we expect them to contribute more via taxation, but not at the price that they pay for the service at the front door. And so it bugs me that child care is being kind of pushed off in this different way, in the way that we wouldn't do for grade school or we wouldn't do for medical care. None of the parties are committing to get that detail right, but we're gonna keep advocating for it at Gen Squeeze. There's always more work to be done. So on that note, i um, gonna suggest we move on to our next issue where there absolutely is a great deal more work to be done, uh, which is climate change. So, um, Gen Squeeze actually just released today this last piece of the voters guide, which is focusing on the kinds of climate actions that party are proposing, parties are proposing. Um, so many people who are on this uh, podcast today might not even have yet seen this hot off the presses uh, piece of work yet. So uh, in the light of that, uh, maybe Paul, you could just start off by giving us a bit of an overview of how things have shaken out on climate um, and who's leading and lagging on this issue. Yeah, and first, I, I almost want to say, now that you just acknowledge it, the climate, the climate analysis came out today, I'm feeling a little bit bagged at this stage, like, wow, it was such a push over the last two weeks to get this all out. And I want to share an irony with the listeners that we work with a great colleague, Dave Sawyer, who leads on our climate change platform analyses, and he was he lives in Ontario, he's in Ottawa, and his ability to actually do this analysis was tremendously slowed down by the extreme weather events that Ontario had been suffering, which knocked out hundreds of... Uh, of electricity poles and caused thousands and thousands of Ontarians to be without power. And so that was actually a contributing factor to the delay in getting our climate change platform analyses out, which I think is a remarkable irony. So now that I've shared that irony, what did the analysis find? In this case, I'm going to say that something that's going to make it harder for me to come across as not being partisan, but I just think it's really critical to make clear. We go in analyzing climate platforms in the light of actually 25 criteria. And at the very top of it is the criteria, are you going to legislate in a way that helps Ontarians benefit as much as we possibly can from holding global temperatures from rising no more than a degree and a half Celsius? And three or four parties commit to science-based goals for how much we will cut emissions by 2030, one party does not. The one party is the Conservative Party in Ontario. Their goal for 2030 is to reduce current carbon emissions uh, by 30% below where they were in 2005. That's a lovely number, but the science makes clear that if we want to have any chance to fend off the worst that climate change has in store for the planet and for Canadians and for Ontarians, then we have to we have to, by 2030, slash our carbon emissions by at least half compared to what they were in 2005. The fact that the Conservative Party doesn't have that goal just, as a result, means the rest of their platform is largely quite noise. It's, you know, they get a low score with us out of our, out of the, we took our 25 uh, action items that we need to see take place. We combined them into like 17 criteria where there was enough information to, to, to sort of assign a score. And out of those 17, the Conservatives are doing just three. That is a low score for something like climate change, which is literally existential for younger Canadians and future generations. And it frustrates me that we don't yet have in Ontario kind of unanimity about that the goal at least. You might differ about how to achieve the goal, but we don't even have unanimity about the importance of the goal and where we need to be in 2030. So that was a big problem. On the flip side, you have the Green Party, which actually scored the, the best in our evaluation this time around. I found that interesting because in the federal election where we ran the exact same analysis, but you know, six, seven months ago, the Green Party federally didn't score the, the, uh, the best on our analysis. And so it was interesting to see in Ontario that the Green Party actually does have a relatively robust plan on how to fight climate change. Then at the other two parties, the Liberals come out in front of the NDP. I think here, you know, what differs between the Greens, the Liberals, and the NDP by comparison with the provincial, uh, the progressive conservatives is to what degree are you willing to use price signals to try and change Ontarians incentives? In other words, are you willing to price pollution and grow the price of pollution? And the Greens have an ambitious plan to do that. 
They also have an ambitious plan to get rid of subsidies for fossil fuels and then use that revenue and redirect it to other issues. That's clearer in the Green platform than it is in the Liberal and the NDP. Interestingly, the NDP doesn't get quite as good a score as the Liberals because it joins in something that's problematic, I would say, in the, in the uh, conservative platform. Both the conservatives and the NDP are doing what may be good retail politics, saying, given all this gas inflation, when at the price at the pump, we're going to try and set a market, we're going to try and lower it for you artificially. But that goes precisely against the signals. The market's already lousy at giving us signals about you know, the actual price and costs of gasoline because it doesn't price in pollution. And now in the middle of this gas inflation, you're having two parties say, but we're going to try and deflate that price artificially. That's really disrupting the logic of trying to put a price on pollution. And so that's one of the reasons why the NDP came out lower than the Liberals and both of those parties came out lower than the Greens when it comes to the robustness of their plan to fight climate change. There's many other details, but I think that's one of the most salient ones that comes across. Yeah, it's interesting your observation about the hesitation on pricing signals, primarily by the conservatives, but also, as you just mentioned, in terms of NDP and gas prices, particularly because all of the parties, um, and, and some perhaps more than others, including the conservatives, are very willing to defer to market forces in other areas of their platforms, like certainly around housing, there's a lot of discussion about um, supply and demand um, and allowing the market to better um, meet supply and demand pressures um, as part or a significant part of a solution to our housing affordability crisis. So it's interesting in particular that conservatives are willing to point to the market there, but yet on climate change are saying that the market kind of market forces that we need to put a price on the things we don't want more of like pollution, um, it, they don't view as an effective strategy. Yeah, there is an interesting ideological disconnect between the two issues. And it's it frustrates me from an intellectual standpoint because conservative parties historically have been parties that really want to rely on markets to get things done. And so you see that playing out in the housing analysis and you will have heard me like, okay, but we've seen that the market isn't delivering homes with enough bedrooms for families with kids. Uh, it's not necessarily delivering enough rental. It's not necessarily delivering enough homes that are actually energy efficient to make our climate change goals. But then in the in the climate change space, you hear the, the you have a couple of parties, especially the conservatives, that say, well, you know, the market's pricing gas at this point, but we don't want that price signal. And so, yeah, there's it's like you know having it both ways, and neither way is actually good for intergenerational fairness, which is so vexing. And I would try and make explicit right now that I totally understand why the pressure at the pumps is hurting people and making people upset. And why political strategists would say, this is a great way for us to win public support by saying we are going to bring pressure off of gas prices when you're at the retail store for gasoline. But while that might be good politics, let there be no mistake, that is terrible intergenerational policy because all that it does is accelerate the pace at, we at which we use the precious and now very rare capacity of the atmosphere's ability to be able to uh, absorb carbon. And we can't, we can't ignore that really any longer. And we just witnessed why during the Ontario election with this incredible storms that were so, you know, affecting so many parts of the province, leaving so many without electricity. And we've seen it in so many other places, whether it's in Manitoba with the flooding or the flooding and the fires we've had in BC. So this is an existential issue and this is a hard truth to any of our listeners and to any of our the family members and friends of our listeners who might disagree with me on this point. We can try and avoid the pressures in our wallet in ways that are going to promote generational fairness or are not going to promote generational fairness. I'd be delighted to reduce price pressures for families with kids by bringing childcare costs down. That's why we're advocating for $10 a day childcare. I'd be delighted to try and invest in ways to bring housing prices down. It's a huge part of the Gen Squeeze mandate. But one way that we don't want to necessarily bring costs down for young people is in terms of paying for our pollution and the same goals for the older folks in our lives. And so that's why you hear Gen Squeeze emphasize so much these affordability issues around family policy and housing policy. But on the climate policy, we insist we pay for our pollution. And I, I worry that in this case, the NDP and the Conservatives are not telling that hard truth to Ontario voters. 
I think that's a great uh, segue, Paul, actually, to uh, talking about the fourth of the issues that is covered in the voter's guide, um, which we describe as whether parties are budgeting fairly to promote the well-being of all generations, um, because it's within that category, I think, that gets at the pressures you're pointing to about whether we're paying for the pollution we're, we're creating now or kind of kicking those bills down the road for future generations to cover, or in this case, for future generations to shoulder the bulk of the climate risk that we're, we're racking up today. So um, as we get into discussing that last piece, I'm wondering, since it's a little different to say budget fairly to promote the well-being of all generations um, than it is to say housing or climate change. Maybe you could just start off by uh, saying a little bit about what exactly do we mean by that phrase? Yeah, and it's one of those things we still need to get better at message testing and figuring out the communication strategy for because you're right. Regularly, people are like, I get what you mean by housing and climate change and family affordability, but what's this well-being budgeting for all generations? And it's like a whole mouthful of just saying it. <laughs> So we will get better at that, bear with us. And if you have any suggestions, send them to us, whether you're listening live or whether or not you're listening to the podcast afterwards. But here's what we're trying to do. We're trying to fuse together two key issues, two key lenses and ways of looking at the world. On the one hand, we want to be able to have Canada invest urgently in people's well-being from the early years onwards, all the way through retirement. We wanna get Canada working and Ontario working well for all generations. But when we do that ana analysis, we see that, whoa, there's this interesting age pattern in Canada where we tend to actually um, reserve much of our public investment for later in our lives. We use most of it for our retirement income supports and our healthcare spending, which we use when we're older for all sorts of good reasons, because we're more frail when we're older. But as a result, we're less likely to invest urgently to make the conditions into which people are born, grow, live, work, and age as healthy and, and optimizing their ability to thrive as they could. And so Jen Squeeze asks, why is that the case? And that's when we see, well, there's this generational tension, our, our, our intergenerational system, just like there's a system of racism and classism and sexism and heterosexism. We also have an intergenerational system, and it is tending to direct our public investment attention away from getting it right for the generation raising young kids. And so this idea of are we budgeting fairly to promote well-being for all generations is saying we need to invest urgently from the early years onwards, and there's a generational dysfunction in our public policy that's getting in the way of investing in that well-being. Oh, that was a mouthful. Can you say it better and shorter, Andrea? Uh, no, that's why I asked you to do it. Okay, I'll get better. I, no, I can say it in one line. <laughs> We have, a, we have a dysfunctional intergenerational system that prevents us from investing in well-being urgently from the early years onwards. That's how we're trying to combine those two ideas into one simple sentence. Well done. Good job. Woo. And I will also actually just remind folks that um, if you have not checked out our uh, latest uh, video, that there's a video, our bad budget money video, that also talks about this, these some of these concepts in a let's just say slightly more humorous way perhaps than on this podcast. So if you're interested in seeing uh, giant people in bunny suits, please tune into that. You can find it at gensqueeze.ca. Um, so thanks for putting up that next scorecard, Paul. Um, so now that we've talked about what we mean by the title, um, maybe you could uh, give us a bit of an overview about how the parties score on this one, because it yeah. certainly stands out compared to the other issues that no one is doing particularly well. Yeah, so you would see in our previous scorecards for housing and family affordability and for climate change that you would have many parties, if not all the parties, like well down the pathway to from the starting line to achieving the goal that we had set, whether it's everyone can afford a home by 2030 that meets their needs or everyone can afford enough time at home with their kids and time at work uh, to pay for their kids by 2030. And the same time, like, let's make sure we got the right 2030 goals to fend off the worst that climate change has to throw it our way. But on budgeting fairly to promote well-being for all generations, you kind of have all parties stuck at the starting line. Um, and one party actually going backwards a little bit. And this has to do with a, a few themes. So I really encourage our listeners to go check out this part on our Ontario Votes Election Voters Guide, because there's some cool tables in there which show that every party running for office this time around, by their own numbers, in their own platforms and their costings, is promising to grow spending 
on those who are over 65, people like my mom who we love, but promising to grow and spending on the, that group much faster than for the generation raising kids. And so for instance, the conservatives are going to grow spending per retiree about 78% faster than they will for people under 45 raising young kids. The other three parties are also gonna do the same, but they're in the range of like 50 to 53% faster. So all parties proposing faster, the conservatives much faster by comparison with the other parties. And so that is a really interesting dimension. Simultaneously, our analysis looks at the degree to which parties are proposing to ask Ontarians to pay for the bills that they want to incur now, or are they proposing instead to rack up the provincial credit card by adding on deficits, which will then punt the bills down to younger Canadians who have to pay them later on or future generations still. And I was really quite dismayed, although not surprised because I saw the same pattern at the federal level just half a year ago, but not a single provincial party in this Ontario election is proposing to balance the budget in the next four years, even though Ontario's economy is not in a recession. There's all sorts of good reasons to run deficits when we're in recessions and we need to like stimulate the economy, but that's not what any of the parties are predicting. And even still, all of the parties are proposing to run deficits. And I had comparable numbers from all the parties for the next three years. So I crunched the numbers and here's how it, plan it plays out. So the Ontario Conservatives plan to increase for every person under 45, the provincial credit card is gonna go up by $4,800. For the Greens, it's gonna be $4,900. For the Liberals, mid 5,000s. And for the NDP, low 6,000s. So every young person is going to inherit more credit card debt from government uh, from all of the parties, no matter who gets in office on January, on January, on June 2nd. I think that's really problematic. And I don't know when Ontario and Canadian political culture tolerated that. When did we, when did we not expect our political parties to have to ha have hard truths with us that we need to pay for what we want to use? But here's one detail that I want to add to distinguish the Greens from the other parties. So the Greens and the PCs are proposing the, the more modest deficit, so they're all in the general ballpark, but they're on the, the lower side. But the one thing that makes the Greens stand out is that every dollar, pretty much, that they're proposing to deficit finance put on the provincial credit card is going to go to finance efforts to fight climate change. We've already chatted about how climate change is this existential threat for younger generations. And so if we're going to incur credit card debt at the provincial level, if we're going to incur these deficits, then doing so to like fight something like climate change from which everyone will benefit, but younger people are going to be around for longer than anyone else to experience the harm of climate change, then that might be what you want to put on the provincial credit card. The other three parties, though, that's not what they're doing. The primary thing driving up deficits for the other three parties is rising medical expenses for the aging population. People we absolutely love. Again, if this had been in BC, this would be my mom we're talking about. It wasn't that long ago my in-laws lived in Ontario. Absolutely want to be caring for those people. But we also want to ask that group to be open to the idea that they should be willing to pay for the medical care they want in their retirement years. And we need to have a hard truth conversation that while that group worked hard and paid taxes throughout their working lives, they didn't prepay into a medical care system uh, at the level of their taxation that will now cover the costs of the medical care they want to draw down. None of the parties have shared that with them. You can't be all that angry with Ontario and retirees for not knowing that, but we desperately need to have that conversation take root maybe after the election when it's less politically controversial to raise it, because this we need to fix and tackle. We can't be a political society that says, win my vote by offering me more stuff, but don't have the hard conversation with me by asking me to pay for it. And that is almost exactly what three of four parties right now are doing, all four parties, but at least the Greens, when they want us to deficit finance, they're doing it for something that those who will end up paying for it down the road are gonna be disproportionately needing, which is less climate change. Yeah, I think that's a really important observation that you make, Paul. And it's, you know, 
even when parties are talking about the more palatable side of the equation of more spending, um, they're not doing it in the context of the fact that more spending now means uh, higher bills. And if we're not increasing revenue or finding other ways to cover the cost of those bills, um, then just like we wouldn't do that in our own families, we don't want to you know, leave them for other folks to have to pick up behind us. So um, that is definitely an issue that's going to persist beyond this election because despite the importance of all these generational fairness issues, housing, families, climate change, and some of the questions around budgeting, um, generational fairness is a lens that's largely missing from this election conversation, um, just it was, as it was been missing from other election conversations as well. So I think that really underscores how we, we continue to have our work cut out for us uh, around this table today and with all the folks uh, on the line to uh, figure out ways to bring that conversation forward. You're so right, actually. If I could just jump in, like all parties could have been further down the towards the goal on this scorecard that's showing for our live audience right now. They could all have been one full step closer to the goal if they simply said they're committed to generational fairness, to making Ontario work for all generations, like just some, just having the goal, but because we don't have the goal even observed, it's, it is not shaping the way that those who are designing the platforms are thinking. And then as a result, we don't have a number of other important details. Like they don't break down in their platform. How is this new investment going to work out by age? Who's going to really benefit? Who isn't? Gen Squeeze is cutting the numbers so that parties could do that. But it's missing that kind of that kind of reporting. And it may sound boring and it may sound wonky, but if we don't have the goal to then drive us to measure things, then we're not going to get the outcomes of budgets fairly and urgently investing in well-being from the early years onwards. And just because I think I might be running out of time, and I don't know if anyone's asked me this question, so I'm going to, you know, the, the microphone's prerogative. When we're talking about the aging population not necessarily having had a chance to pay fully for the medical care that is being promised to them right now by all the parties, that might have been okay if our aging population was the group that was especially hurting economically right now. But what the data show is that at least for the majority of uh, older Ontarians who are homeowners, the very thing that's been hurting housing affordability for their kids and grandchildren has been making them wealthier. And we've said earlier in this live podcast that over the last two years during the pandemic, Ontario's housing system has printed more wealth in housing in any two year period for the typical homeowner by comparison with any other province, even by comparison, the wacky wild west of British Columbia, which has got insane real estate issues, that even BC doesn't compete with what's happened in Ontario in the last couple of years. And never have we seen this kind of wealth uh, windfall being produced by home ownership at any time in the last half century. We are not at a moment where necessarily Ontario is actually short on resources or short on revenue. Wealth was printed literally in people's homes over the uh, pandemic, especially. And yet there is not a conversation to say, might we be able to tap into some of that additional housing wealth to help those, especially an older demographic, pay for the medical care that they understandably want to use while they're aging. And also to invest in some of the deeply affordable purpose-built rental and cooperative housing that might help their kids and grandchildren. And I get increasingly angry about that. And I must confess, I don't know if anyone can see, I haven't been so good with my camera on today. I can't actually see my face in the screens before me. And I've been looking at my Twitter account and I'm seeing this one rag newspaper based in Ottawa that keeps ragging on us for actually bringing to political leaders the idea that we should be inviting the, the Ontarians and Canadians more generally who live in homes over a million dollars, which makes you in the top 10, 12% of Canadians in terms of the value of the asset in which you live to ask those people to show allegiance to the Canadian dream that a good home should be in reach for what hard work can earn by contributing a little bit more of the wealth that they've gained from their housing uh, in order to pay for medical care for our aging loved ones, in order to try and slow down home prices which are hurting younger Canadians and invest in housing that families with kids and other people need. Well, I was going to ask you for some concluding uh, thoughts, Paul, but I think you've beat me to it. And that's a great place, I think, to wrap up our live podcast for today on the Voter's Guide. Um, so thanks, everybody who was able to join or everybody who's listening into this down the road. And it's a recording on the website. 
Um, definitely hope that you all plan to head out to the voting booth on June 2nd. However you cast your vote, um, please keep in mind generational fairness issues uh, and the analysis that we've presented here today. Um, there's lots more work to be done to bring these issues to the forefront, as Paul's just said, but uh, we really welcome having you join in our efforts to do that. Uh, our influence and power as an organization grows with the size of our network. So it's your voices that help to build our influence in the world of politics. Um, so we encourage you to visit our website, gensqueeze.ca. You can sign up or subscribe to our videos and podcasts there. And of course, check out the full voter's guide or send it to your friends and family if they haven't yet had a chance to take a look. Paul, any final thoughts you want to share? Just one last one. Like you really nailed it in terms of like our organizational influence grows with the size of our network. But I can't underscore the number of times that I've been either in Queen's Park or at the, at the House of Commons in Ottawa where just the sheer size of who turns up at the ballot box by age matters. And so I don't, you know, if there's a bunch of younger people out there today who don't agree with the analysis at Gen Squeeze, I still want you to go vote. Go vote because the more you vote gives the entire generational cohort more power in the world of politics. And I will ask all of the lovely, talented grandparents out there, grandmothers, grandfathers, think about the legacy that you want to leave for your kids and grandchildren one of the things that we do with this voter's guide is to help you see how that legacy is playing out. And we hope that some of the information that we've provided in the voter's guide can help you work on leaving the proud legacy that you want for your kids and grandchildren. Have a great evening, everybody. Go Thanks, vote. everybody.